we're going to get started. Um, before we do, I just want to point out for those of you on that uh, we are going to take audience questions. Please be sure to utilize the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Type in questions and uh, we will address those at the conclusion. I would now like to turn the floor over to uh, Bill Korn, CEO of CareCloud. Bill, I'm gonna have you take it away, tell your story, and we will uh, answer questions uh, at the end. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Bill Korn, uh, CFO, actually, not CEO, uh, CFO of uh, CareCloud. Uh, we're a healthcare technology company, and I appreciate everybody taking some uh, some time to listen to us uh, today. Uh, so uh, CareCloud was started about 22 years ago by Mahmoud Haq. Uh, Mahmoud is, was a uh, American Express executive. Uh, he had uh, set up another business, done a roll-up, taken it public, had it uh, bought, and was then trying to, uh, to think about uh, how to solve problems for his wife's medical practice. Uh, you see uh, his wife standing there next to him as we were ringing the, uh, the NASDAQ uh, bell uh, nine years ago when the company went public. Uh, his wife is an internist, and uh, Mahmoud started uh, the company originally called Medical Transcription Billing Corporation uh, as a way to, uh, to meet the needs of her practice. And uh, today, and I'll, uh, I'll tell you more about the, uh, the company, but uh, today we have three classes of stock that, uh, that trade on, uh, on NASDAQ. And uh, you know, after we talk about the, uh, the company, you can think about what, uh, what makes sense for you. Uh, our, our common stock is a, uh, is a class of shares that would probably be great for investors who are looking for growth. Uh, and we have two classes of non-convertible preferred, uh, one of which I'd say is ideal for people who are looking for, uh, for solid uh, monthly income. So let's talk more about the company and then we'll come back to our uh, to our stock. So you know, as I mentioned, we were uh, we were we were started 22 years ago. We've been public for uh, for nine years. Uh, we've had over a 30 percent compound annual growth rate since our IPO. Uh, a lot of that growth was through M and A. Uh, more recently, we've invested in organic sales and, uh, and marketing, uh, which is uh, which is fueling some uh, some additional growth. Uh, in 2022, there was a pause in the uh, the M and A activity, uh, not because we weren't interested, but because we really didn't find deals that were attractively priced. And, and I'll talk about what we look for in, in acquisitions as we uh, as we go forward. Uh, also, in uh, in 2022, uh, there were two large health system uh, clients uh, that had come to us through an acquisition in 2020. Uh, each of those health systems had actually been acquired long before we started servicing them. Uh, and as luck would have it, both of them actually completed migration to their acquirer systems in, uh, in mid last year. Uh, so that kind of put a, a little bit of a, a lull in, uh, in 2022's uh, growth rate. Uh, but nonetheless, if you took those two clients out of both 2021 and 2022, uh, we would have seen seven percent organic uh, growth uh, in 2022, which uh, which is probably better than the average in the uh, in the industry. So, if you think about our uh, our client base, uh, you know, I mentioned that our uh, that our founder's wife was uh, was client uh, number one. Her office is a couple miles from uh, from headquarters, so she uh, and her staff get to uh, uh, to test out new products all the time. Uh, today. Uh, roughly 25% of our revenue comes from small medical practices. So the, uh, the what I call the one to, uh, to five uh, doctor practices. Uh, there's about 50% of our revenue coming from large physician groups that uh, that could be 10 doctors. Uh, it could be as high as 2,700 physical therapists. So, so pretty large, uh, large size groups. Uh, about 20% of our revenue comes from hospitals and, uh, and health systems. And that's an area where we've uh, increased our focus over the last uh, year or two. Uh, and we've also got some revenue coming through, uh, through deals with, uh, with industry partners. Uh, when you think about the, uh, the services we provide, uh, think about what are the things that a, uh, that a doctor is looking for uh, and, and, and will help them uh, meet their needs. And you know, fundamentally, doctors go to med school so they can focus on patients and helping the patients to, uh, to live healthy and, uh, and, and, and solve their medical issues. And the last thing that a doctor wants to, uh, to take care of is sending the bills to insurance, following up to make sure it gets paid, you know, making sure they've got HIPAA compliant software. So our notion is that we want to take care of all that so the doctors can really focus on, uh, on the practice of medicine. That, that's why they're really in, uh, in practice. 
And uh, so I'd say fundamentally for uh, for most practices, that starts with what we call technology enabled uh, revenue cycle management, you know, essentially sending those bills into insurance. Uh, doing it in an automated fashion and making sure that we know what's necessary to get the bill paid so that 95% or more of them uh, can get paid uh, automatically with no human intervention. You know, uh, but then having the, uh, the team uh, that can handle that 5%, because if you don't follow up uh, with insurance, I hate to say it, but sometimes they're going to look for any excuse not to, uh, not to pay a bill. And uh, getting those bills paid for uh, for our clients is fundamental, uh, and 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 that's one of the things that we uh, that we specialize in doing. So we've got a, a large team offshore, and I'll, I'll talk about the offshore operations uh, that focuses on on following up with Medicare, following up with private insurance, Medicaid, whatever. Uh, in addition to the revenue cycle management, uh, one of the uh, the key things that uh, the doctors are looking for is software to run their practice. So that includes electronic health records. You've all seen doctors taking notes, whether it's on their PC or if they're using one of our systems, it could be on their iPad uh, uh, or, uh, you know, the, we, 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 we focus on how to, uh, how to make it easy for the docs to, uh, to take their notes. Uh, uh, we've, got, uh, we've got a couple of certified EHR systems uh, one that was developed internally that was uh, designed for those smaller practices again, like our like our original uh, you know doctor uh, who's whose client number one. Uh, we also have and 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 that's cloud based uh, again developed internally. Uh, when we bought a company whose name we took uh, CareCloud, so we uh, we bought this company in the beginning of 2020. Uh, they also had cloud based software. Uh, but they took a little bit different approach. They kind of focused on all the bells and whistles that are needed by a larger practice. Uh, and we've now got a, essentially a pro version and a, and a, uh, and a light version that are available, uh, whichever is more usable for the, uh, for that particular practice. We've, we've got them both and they, and they interoperate. Uh, we've got the practice management system that's used to, uh, to schedule appointments, check on insurance eligibility. We have the patient experience software. So again, the, Patient can log in, request a refill, set up an appointment, look at the notes from the last visit. Uh, in addition, uh, we do things like staff augmentation, uh, professional services. So, you know, one hospital acquires another and wants to integrate the systems. We have the team that can do that. Uh, we're even managing uh, several medical practices that came through a uh, through an acquisition about five years ago, uh, where we actually run the practices, employ the nurses, uh, receptionists, uh, et cetera. The uh, the newest offering that we have, uh, CareCloud Wellness, is, we think is pretty uh, pretty exciting. And and think about how the practice of medicine has changed just over the last couple of years. 2019 and before, when you thought about a a visit with a doctor, you thought about going to their office in person. And uh, we actually added telemedicine to our platform in 2019. And our uh, our original thought was that we were going to uh, set up a service more like Teladoc. Uh, letting the existing group of, uh, of doctors be able to, uh, to provide uh, remote visits to, uh, to patients uh, that could be geographically distant, could even be in another, uh, another country. Uh, and we were working on getting that software all set up as 2020 started. And of course, COVID hit. So you think about uh, how the world pivoted to, uh, to telemedicine. Uh, for our docs, it was pretty interesting because we could uh, tell them, You've already got telemedicine software. It's HIPAA compliant. It's integrated with your EHR. It's available on your app. It's available on the, uh, the patient portal. Uh, and you can use it. And by the way, just like uh, we do with the rest of our software, if you've signed up and you want to use, the, uh, use us for billing and you want to use the software, the whole software platform is included all in the, uh, the same uh, price. So no extra charge to you. You've got telemedicine available. So you know, so for us in, in 2020, our docs pivoted almost immediately to, to 100% telehealth. And, and of course, by now, the world's gone back uh, hybrid. But we see a, uh, another change in, uh, in healthcare that we think is as big as the, uh, as the telemedicine uh, initiative. Uh, and uh, think about patients who've got chronic conditions. And what's the right way to manage somebody with a chronic condition, whether it's high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, uh, you're probably not going to get them to go in person to the doctor every month. 
you're not going to uh, do as well with just a uh, telemedicine visit. So that hybrid uh, chronic care management visit is something that we've been thinking about and the industry has been thinking about for a while. Uh, Medicare changed their rules uh, uh, roughly about a year or so ago, and private insurance uh, changed as well uh, to really emphasize these uh, these chronic visits. And uh, and and once the uh, the Medicare rules were uh, were changed last year, uh, we introduced an offering that we call Chronic Care Management that's part of our Care Care Cloud Wellness brand. Uh, and the you know the notion here is uh, we're going to have licensed caregivers. Who can have a uh, a monthly visit with the uh, with a patient who's got one or more chronic conditions? Uh, this can be video, it could be audio if that's what they want. Uh, it's following the uh, the care regimen that's uh, that's set up by the uh, by the doctor. And uh, you know the notion here is let's see that everything is fine. If it's good, let's set up time for uh, for next month. If there's a problem, we need to get you back into uh, to see your uh, physician. Let's schedule that appointment right now. And uh, as we've uh, as we've started to uh, to uh, roll out this offering, uh, we've uh, retained a, a firm uh, that's working for us uh, with care managers. So initially, we'll be using a, a third party. Eventually, we may do some of that work in uh, in house. Uh, we've integrated it with the uh, the capabilities uh, and, and our systems. And we've set things up so that uh, as reimbursement comes in, uh, the doctors are getting money. So even though we're actually doing the uh, doing the visit, uh, the doc gets some, uh, some extra revenue. Uh, the patient hopefully uh, stays healthier. And then again, the uh, the goal here for Medicare and, and other uh, payers is it's a lot uh, more cost effective to pay $100 for a monthly visit than to pay ten thousand dollars when the uh, the patient makes it into the uh, emergency room. So let's let's keep them uh, out of the ER. Uh, we've also added a second uh, offering called remote patient monitoring. So unlike the chronic care management where there's a person involved, uh, remote patient monitoring is pretty much all electronic. So you give the patient something like a uh, an automated blood pressure cuff. And again, think about what would your average doctor do if 500 patients gave their blood pressure readings every day? No way to follow up on that. On the other hand, what happens when uh, when when this comes into my software? We can go compare to uh, to the readings that this patient has had before. Uh, we can see everything's on track. Okay, normal day. You know, out of 500 patients, maybe there's one where readings look a little bit off, and they uh, again, then then it causes you to uh, to say, here's a chance to, uh, to to bring you back into the doctor while while you're not in trouble yet. Uh, figure out what adjustments we need to uh, to make and, and keep you healthy. Uh, so so far as we've uh, introduced this, the response has been uh, been great. Uh, last year, we signed up uh, uh, doctors who, when uh, when this is fully rolled out with their patients, uh, will generate an extra seven uh, an extra six million dollars of annual revenue for us. And we've kind of looked at the uh, this offering in phase one. Let me offer this to my existing uh, practices. And, and we think that could give us up to $50 million of additional uh, incremental revenue. Uh, phase two is going to be, let me introduce this and, uh, and, and uh, give it to other practices as well, kind of as a, uh, as, as a way to get them interested in, uh, in working with us. So, you know, we're pretty excited about Care Cloud Wellness. So I think what I'll, uh, what I'll do now is, uh, is give you a, uh, you know, a couple of case studies of, of a couple of practices that we work with, again, just to, to help you think about, you know, who, who, who are typical clients that would work with uh, CareCloud? Uh, I'm going to go through these pretty briefly. Rocky Mountain International uh, in, Internal Medicine is one of the, uh, the largest healthcare providers in, uh, in Denver. Uh, we started servicing them in 2018, starting with the revenue cycle management. Uh, they started using our EHR, patient experience software. Uh, during COVID, they, uh, they started to use our telehealth solution with great success. And last year they signed up for chronic care management and remote patient monitoring to support their, uh, their patient base. Uh, Fox Rehab, Fox is, uh, is one of our largest uh, uh, customers. Uh, they are probably one of the world's largest providers of physical therapy and occupational therapy uh, in the home for, uh, for older adults. So think about this as a, as a geriatric uh, you know, in-home uh, patient uh, visit. Uh, when we started uh, servicing the, them, initially we were following up on old AR. 
Uh, then they asked it to, to take over billing, insurance claims. Uh, we built a new mobile app for their people to be able to uh, to enter claims uh, and, and enter information uh, while they're uh, while they're out visiting uh, uh, patients. Uh, we took took over the credentialing process. That was actually a big deal for them because credentialing is when uh, when you hire a a new provider and you want to get them uh, set up to uh, to bill for insurance. Uh, that was about a six month process before we started working with them. And now that our team is in, uh, is engaged, uh, now we get new docs, uh, new uh, new therapists uh, able to uh, to bill in a uh, in a month or so. Uh, so you know that's really helped them bringing their AR down, uh, bringing their uh, their denials down. So you know all the things that you'd want if you if you're focusing on uh, on growing your practice. Uh, Hutchison Clinic, another another good example. So this is a uh, multi specialty group in uh, in uh, Hutchison, Kansas. Uh, they've seen uh, tremendous growth. Uh, in 2019, they asked us to streamline their systems and their uh, revenue cycle management operations. Uh, and again, we've we've been able to uh, to reduce denied claims. Uh, we've been able to improve the uh, the collection rate and the uh, the days that uh, that it takes for them to uh, uh, to get reimbursed. So again, we you know we look at at uh, at our goal as uh, as taking uh, taking over the things that uh, that are necessary. Uh, to allow these practices to uh, to grow and, and to focus on uh, the practice of, uh, of medicine. So if you think about our, uh, our growth strategy, there's actually three elements to uh, to that. And, and at the time of the IPO, uh, I would say candidly, we really were not so focused on organic growth uh, because we found that we could acquire businesses who had some challenges uh, for less than our competitors could grow organically. So we'd see, uh, larger competitors spending a dollar twenty-five in, in uh, marketing and sales uh, to add a dollar of, uh, of annual recurring revenue, and if we could buy a uh, business and, and 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 a book of business for less than that, and we were often you know fifty cents, seventy-five cents for a dollar of annual recurring revenue, that was where we put our focus. Now, I will say, after we went public, people would say, "Bill, it's great that you've got a thirty-five percent compound annual growth rate. How much of that's organic?" And when we had no salespeople, there wasn't very much that was organic. Well, uh, we really uh, put more emphasis over the uh, over the last couple of years on on the organic side. Uh, and today, we've now got fifty five people worldwide focused on uh, marketing and sales. Uh, we've gone from under one percent to over seven percent of revenue on marketing and sales, uh, and we're getting good traction with new clients, as well as the uh, good traction with new offerings like uh, CareCloud Wellness. Now. We're still looking for accretive acquisitions. Uh, I would say that uh, that our challenge is we have a pretty high bar. When we want to buy someone, we like to see that uh, for the investment that I make, I'm going to get a return on that investment, profits, cash flow in three to four years. And uh, you know, the way we'll uh, we'll do that is a combination of utilizing our uh, our technology, using our uh, our offshore team. And finding ways that uh, that we can reduce the uh, the cost and the and the profitability, and and we've been able to do that repeatedly. Uh, we're always looking for deals like that. Uh, in 2022, we didn't find anybody that met our criteria. Uh, our guidance for uh, for 2023 assumes that we're not going to go uh, continue to uh, to make acquisitions. Uh, but I'd say we're always looking for the uh, for the next good uh, good deal. So thinking about our uh, our guidance uh, in terms of our uh, revenue growth, uh, what I've done here, uh, I've shown in the uh, the blue parts of the uh, the bar, I've taken out these uh, these two uh, two health systems. Uh, when we bought Meridian in in mid 2020, uh, these two health systems had each been acquired uh, several years earlier, and 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 we're using Meridian for uh, for some of their uh, services. Uh, they had. Started down the process of migrating to their uh, acquirers systems. Uh, we recognized that it would be hard to uh, to stop that process, so we knew that the uh, that this revenue was going away. We just didn't really know when. Uh, we were initially told that they'd both be done with their uh, with their migration at the end of 2020. Well, that actually turned out to be mid 2022. Uh, so if you exclude those two systems, uh, our 2021 revenue would have been 118 million. Our 2022 revenue would have been 126.7, uh, 
and you would have actually seen 7% growth. Uh, when you think about our, uh, our revenue in 2023, uh, we've guided the street that it's going to be 142 to 146 million. Uh, there's roughly 2 million, even though these two have, have pretty much uh, wound down, there's roughly 2 million of residual revenue that will come from those. So if I take that out, uh, I'd actually be showing 12% organic growth rate in, uh, in 2023. And again, that's a combination of new practices that we've uh, signed up. Uh, as well as cross-selling the uh, the CareCloud wellness offering. Uh, in addition to that 12% uh, organic revenue growth, uh, our plan of, of 24 or our guidance of 24 to 27 million of adjusted EBITDA for uh, for this year is 15% growth in uh, in EBITDA. And uh, again, uh, we're you know, we're always focused uh, when we acquire a business and and even when it's running smoothly on how do I automate things? How do I eliminate the uh, the overhead? How do I uh, take work away from uh, subcontractors and give it to, uh, to my own team offshore if, uh, if, if that's where it makes sense? Uh, and how do, how do, we, uh, how do we bring the, uh, the margins up even while we're investing more in, uh, in sales and marketing each year? So we have three unique strengths that I think are uh, are the key to uh, to giving us a a competitive advantage. You know, the first is the technology platform. You know, I mentioned that uh, that we developed uh, the core technology ourselves. Uh, most of our acquisitions have really been around customers, but uh, the company whose name we took uh, that we bought in 2020, uh, CareCloud, had some good technology. Uh, Meridian, uh, which we also bought in 2020, had some good technology. Uh, and we've worked on integrating these into uh, in, in, into a platform. Uh, we've got about 500 uh, people in total on our technology team, most of whom are, are offshore. Uh, the global team has uh, 4,000 employees, 3,500 of whom are, are offshore. Uh, most of that offshore team is in uh, Pakistan, some in, uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, and those people are one-tenth the cost of similarly educated and, uh, and experienced people in the, uh, the U.S., so that's clearly a, a major strength uh, of ours and, and something that, uh, that very few other people can talk about. And finally, our uh, track record of, uh, of acquisitions. We've, uh, we've bought 17 companies since our IPO, and we have a proven process to, uh, to integrate the businesses and, uh, and ring out the, uh, the cost. So I thought I'd give you a, you know, a couple of uh, photos again so you can see the, uh, the operation. Uh, I don't have a photo of our uh, headquarters. I'd say the headquarters building is is not remarkable when you pull into the parking lot, you think you're, you're, you're showing up like at a small dentist office. It's, you know, it does not look like a headquarters of a, uh, of a global NASDAQ uh, company. Uh, there's 21 uh, desks in a uh, thousand square feet. On the other hand, the, uh, the building you see at the, uh, the upper right in, uh, in Bog in uh, Pakistan is one of the, uh, the two offices there uh, that hold 3,500 employees. And you see some, uh, some shots of uh, people working uh, in, in in various rooms there, so uh, you know you got a lot of uh, a lot of folks, uh, most of whom uh, the senior people tend to work U.S. hours. Uh, they you know they've got uh, accessibility by a U.S. phone number. The people who are on the phone with the uh, with the customers uh, you know are chosen because uh, they can speak English well. And uh, and and when we move work from a subcontractor to our own team offshore. You know, we give people their dedicated account manager. So you know, this this becomes a uh, you know a great way for us to uh, to leverage the uh, the team you know, a lot more cost effectively than uh, than hiring lots of uh, additional people in the U.S. So I mentioned our uh, our stock. So I think it's it's worth thinking about our cap structure that's a little bit non traditional. So we we went public in uh, in July of uh, two thousand fourteen. Uh, at the time, the uh, the IPO, we had ten million in, in trailing revenue. Uh, the stock was five dollars a share. Fast forward nine years, uh, we're now one hundred forty million in revenue, and the stock is below the IPO price. And uh, so, uh, what I'd say for for those who are thinking about growth opportunities, are you know our, our stock has fallen by from uh, from ten twelve dollars a share two and a half years ago to uh, to over three just a little over three dollars today. Uh, we th we tend to think the market is uh, isn't really valuing us. We we think some of that is is kind of a general phenomena that uh, that small and micro cap growth companies uh, people are are kind of shying away from uh, today. Uh, you know, just thinking about global uncertainty, interest rates, not knowing what's going to happen. Uh, I also think that 
we've been kind of under the radar and we need to do a better job of, uh, of telling the story and getting people thinking about it. So if you're somebody who's thinking about uh, growth, I think the common stock is a uh, is certainly an interesting opportunity for you. Uh, because this, the common stock has uh, has really not, uh, it hasn't reached the levels that we would find uh, exciting. Uh, the way we funded most of our growth has been selling non-convertible preferred. And uh, we have two classes of, uh, of preferred that trade on, uh, on NASDAQ. Uh, the original one, uh, Series A, has been out there for, uh, for seven years. Uh, so it's, uh, it, 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 it's well established. Uh, we actually started redeeming it uh, last year. Uh, and, and, and so the Series A is fully redeemable at $25 a share. Uh, so I'd have to say, you know, being candid, uh, spending over $26 for a stock that could get redeemed for 25 is probably not something that I would uh, suggest people think about. Uh, on the other hand, the, uh, the Series B shares, uh, and, and, the, and the two series are, are, are Parry Passu, uh, the Series B shares pay a uh, an 8.75% uh, dividend on the $25 par price. And for whatever reason, over the last, uh, especially over the last two weeks, uh, that uh, Series B that, uh, that that had been sitting there trading uh, solidly at 25, uh, it, it almost seems like uh, you know somebody needed to, uh, to sell some shares and the price went down. I have no idea why uh, why that stock is doing what it's doing. Uh, but you can get those shares today at $21, $22 a share. And I'd say, you know, when you think about uh, an instrument that pays a, a monthly dividend in cash, uh, paid it, uh, pays the dividends on the 15th of the month and paid last month's uh, dividend on March 15th. So, uh, you know, so it's, so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a good source of, uh, of, of cash payments and, and in fact, if you take that and compare it to the uh, to the current price, the strip yield is something like nine or ten percent. So it's it's a pretty good uh, rate of interest. Uh, you know, I think that's an that's an interesting one. And uh, yes, it 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 will be redeemable in the future. But when it's redeemable, it'll be redeemable at twenty five. So there'll actually be a little appreciation. But I'd say you could even think about that and say if I if I bought this just for its uh, for its current yield, it's not a bad instrument. You know, overall, the uh, the company's enterprise value is uh, is a little under two hundred million dollars. Uh, again, when you think about the uh, the revenue guidance, when you think about the EBITDA guidance, you know, I'd say the uh, the seven sell side analysts who uh, who cover us uh, would all suggest that uh, that we're selling at a uh, at a pretty significant discount to uh, to our peers. And uh, anyway, I would say that uh, that you know, for you folks, think about the common. Think about the series B preferred, you know, whichever one is better for your needs. Uh, you know, there's, uh, I, I would, I would say you probably could, uh, should, should just choose the one that, uh, that, that meets your, your particular interest uh, better than the, than the other. So, you know, sort of summarizing, uh, if you want to learn more about the, uh, the business, uh, you know, I'd suggest uh, you could go to, uh, to uh, our investor relations website, which is ir.carecloud.com. Uh, you can download a copy of this presentation. Uh, you can see, uh, you know, other uh, management presentations, you know, in, in the IR website under uh, company information, there's a video page. Uh, we did an investor and analyst day in, uh, in December. Uh, there's a whole bunch of videos there, uh, you know, probably more hours of uh, things that you want to look at, but, you know, maybe a few minutes looking at the offshore operations, maybe a couple of minutes listening to, uh, to Carrie, the, uh, the customer from Fox Rehab would be interesting. Uh, and finally, on the IR website, you can sign up for alerts so that when we issue uh, press releases, you can uh, you can get those delivered to uh, to your email. So with that, maybe let's uh, open the uh, the floor for some questions. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, yeah, a lot of questions have uh, come in. Um, can you talk about your IP security having your back office in Bangladesh? Well, so the back office is. Uh, uh, the people of Pakistan, not Bangladesh, but oh, uh, okay, sorry. Uh, but but the uh, the the technology, uh, the uh, the servers are all uh, either Amazon or Google uh, Cloud. So uh, so the uh, the servers are not sitting at the uh, the office. Uh, I mentioned we have 500 people on our technology team, so we we have a lot of people focused on uh, on security. We have a lot of people focused on uh, on doing everything from. Uh, checking firewalls are good, doing the, uh, the the various forms of testing that you want to do, and, and candidly, 
if we if we had the whole technology team here, it would probably be hard to afford as many people focusing on uh, on IT security. Uh, I think having those people overseas uh, actually lets us uh, lets us hire ten times as many as uh, as we could here for the uh, for the same dollar. And uh, you know, our our systems have have been uh, repeatedly tested by by a lot of parties, you know, whether it be large customers. Uh, there are actually a couple of very big industry participants who we partner with who, who've done you know a fair amount of uh, of testing on us before saying yes i want to use your uh, your capabilities and, and we feel really good about that uh, also even as the us government uh, changes requirements for ehrs i think uh, last year we were one of the first 10 that was uh, was certified out of uh, out of several hundred so you know we we've got people who pretty much stay on top of this stuff Great, thank you. Um, do you see remote healthcare continuing to grow? Uh, is this the modern day house call? Yeah, I, I, I think the hybrid model is, is, is gonna be the, uh, the wave of the future. You know, I think anybody who says, you know, I'm never gonna see the doctor in person again, you know, that's probably not the right way to, uh, to do it. On the other hand, there are a lot of times, and, and again, uh, think about the, uh, the whole notion of, uh, uh, of our chronic care management, you get, You've got a chronic condition. You're not going to take the time out of your day to uh, to go see that doctor every month. Uh, but if you can have conversations repeatedly, uh, you know, every month, just keep track of it. Whether it's a doctor, a nurse, a care manager, now you're having a problem. Now is the time you need to uh, to go in. So you know, we see that really being the uh, the wave of the uh, the future. And uh, and I don't I don't I don't think that people are ever going to want to go back to I have to drive or fly or whatever to get to my uh, to my specialist they're you know they're going to want to be able to do it on uh, on their terms and, uh, and and we think that that's a that's a great alternative um are you seeing any new technology in the marketplace utilizing web3 or a virtual reality uh so the the virtual reality you know, we, we we've seen people playing with it uh AI, on the other hand, is something that uh, that you know. I'd say we've actually been using AI for years. I mean, the the world started to think about it when uh, Chatbot GPT came out, and then now now we have GPT four. Well, one of the companies that we bought in in twenty twenty uh, was a spinoff from uh, from GE, and so this was uh, some AI technology, some uh, some bots that uh, that were developed by GE uh, that we incorporate in our process. So. Uh, you know, to us again, that's pretty exciting. Thinking about, uh, you know, instead of having a worker go gather everything needed to submit a claim, you know, I can basically let these uh, these uh, these bots go out there and say, if it's Blue Cross and it's New Jersey and it's this particular condition, here's the information they need to uh, to get it paid. Let me find all that. Let's pull that all together and let's submit it all uh, with no human intervention. And 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 to us. That cost savings is uh, is dramatic, and and it's under the cover from uh, with with a lot of things we're doing today. So we see a lot of uh, a lot of stuff with uh, with with leading edge technology. We tend not to emphasize the technology so much because our customers they care about the results. <laughs> they don't really want to know what's behind the the curtain. They just want to know it gets submitted, it gets paid. You know. Um, what are your differentiators? Do any competitors have a uh, care cloud type wellness? type offering? So, you know, I think uh, one of the things that really differentiates us is, is the fact that we have this uh, this combination of software and services. And uh, if you think about others who are in, uh, in our space, a lot of them, I would say, are really software companies. And they built an EHR practice management. They're good at software. Services is a little bit of an afterthought, and and they don't have the uh, the low cost team that uh, that we we do, so therefore they can't really uh, develop those offerings. There's also a lot of revenue cycle uh, management service companies who don't have the software, so I do think it's it's that combination that really uh, is exciting. And, and in the remote patient monitoring arena, we've talked to a dozen companies who've got a particular device that they think is going to revolutionize things, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, for, for diabetes or for uh, checking uh, obstruction in the airway for somebody with asthma. The challenge is they've got this device. They focused on the hardware. They've focused on the software related to the device itself, but they haven't thought about how you integrate it. And for us, again, 
the de standalone device is worth much less than the device if I can if I can plug this into your EHR, whether it's my own EHR or into a competitor system. I mean, we we've kind of designed our wellness offering thinking about the fact that you know while we have a lot of people who use us, a lot of them use Athena, a lot of them use Allscripts, a lot of them use CERN. It doesn't really matter. So let's uh, let's develop an offering that that'll work with any EHR in the market that will check on uh, the, the patient's actual condition and uh, and update the doctor and allow them to provide yet better care. So so we think again, so thinking about it holistically, we're we probably have the competitive uh, edge. Not that we're the only one, but we probably have the the most advanced uh, set of integrated software and service capabilities. Thank you. Um, can you talk about your strategy of making acquisitions in a down market and how do you assure you're buying at a value inflection point? Yep. And I mean, we, uh, the, the, the two biggest acquisitions we did were in 2020. And if you think about the world in 2020, that was pretty much for a lot of people a down <laughs> market. Uh, we doubled in size in 2020. And uh, we bought CareCloud in January. So, uh, so you could argue that the, the time that we, that we did the CareCloud deal, the market itself wasn't yet totally down. Uh, that was a company that had had maybe $130 million of venture capital invested in it. At the point that we bought them, uh, they were out raising money as they had almost every year. Uh, they were in default on their debt. Uh, we bought them from the debt fund. So the debt fund, we, we, we gave the debt fund some shares of our, uh, of our preferred stock uh, to, uh, to, to pay for the acquisition. Uh, the VCs lost their entire $130 million investment. And yeah, we 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 looked at that and, and applied the same metric that we always do, which is let me think about uh, and build a model before I build uh, I, I buy this company. What are their costs? How can I reduce them? And how can I get the the profits and the cash flow so that in three or four years I can get back uh, what I paid for the business? And you know, an example is they had gorgeous offices in Miami, and our statement was, you, know, you got offices that are so nice. But you spend a lot more every month on your rent than we do every year. You know, does that really make sense when you're in default on your debt and you're out there raising another twenty million dollars? Uh, their CEO statement is, well, that's why I only signed a, uh, a three-year lease uh, last month. Okay, from my, from from our perspective, that that's why he did a great job delivering a, a company to uh, to us, and we could shake his hands on the on the day of the transition and say thank you very much. Because that isn't the mentality. None of our customers care about our offices being nice. Yeah, you know, nobody nobody wants to say, okay, you're on the on the top floor of the building with gorgeous views. You don't need that. I mean, again, why do we have a small headquarters when when we need people to uh, to to support the headquarters staff? The first place to uh, to look is can I can I do that overseas? Can I automate it? Yeah. You know? Can I find people who come through another acquisition who I can give them some additional workload and uh, and, and keep them uh, gainfully employed here in the U.S.? I mean, so I want to have people. Uh, when I when I buy a company, I want to keep the people with the customer relationships. I want to keep the sort of the senior technology people with the with the vision, the architects, the product managers, the folks who are doing the more main, mundane things. You know what? Let's do the more main, mundane things more cost effectively. And you know, as we as we think about acquisitions, we're always focused on, you know, how am I going to get that return on investment in three to four years? And you know, sometimes you think it's going to happen in three to four years, and it takes five. Okay, you, know, you still got you still got profitability. You're still doing pretty well. I'll compare that with some of the companies we talked to last year. Would say, well, I think I'm worth five times revenue, and and I'm small and private. And, and I didn't take any money for the last couple of years. So I don't really know what my value is. So I'm going to assume it's the same as it was a few years ago, which is probably not a good assumption, but, but that's what they wanted. And okay, if I pay five times revenue for a business that's not yet profitable, how many years is it going to take me to get a return on that investment? I mean, if I could bring the cost to zero, it would be a five-year ROI, but that's not really realistic. So if I got them from, from nothing to 50% margin, which would be phenomenal, it'd be 10 years. I look at that and say, you know, if it starts out looking like 10 years, it doesn't get any better. You know, that's just not a deal I really want to do. And, and so, you know, we, we have to go look at a lot of deals and find somebody who's motivated 
and 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 we could do a deal on terms that we think are going to make sense going forward. And so, so if that means it takes us a little longer to do a deal, and uh, and people will say, Bill, it's twenty months since you bought somebody. Okay, it's twenty months. You know, I'd rather wait a few more months and find the right deal than uh, than pull the trigger right now and feel later like later on maybe I didn't get the uh, the ROI that I was looking for. Um, do you find that there's a better margin opportunity with um, smaller practitioners or with the larger corporate hospital practices? Yeah, so I, I would say it's probably more in the, uh, the the doctor practices as opposed to the uh, to the hospitals in, in in terms of a of a margin percent. You know, I think in terms of total dollars, there's certainly a lot of opportunity in the uh, the hospitals, and uh, you know, I'd say we traditionally focused on the ambulatory practices. And it's really over the last couple of years that we've started to get some inroads with, uh, with hospitals. And it was a, uh, a company that we bought in, uh, in mid 2021, uh, that, that company's name is MedSR. It was actually a merger of Medmatica and Santa Rosa staffing. Uh, and they were a uh, professional services firm servicing the, uh, the hospital space. So again, Hospital A buys uh, Hospital B or buys a practice, or they want to convert from Cerner to Meditech or whatever. So they've got people to uh, to do that. They've got the rent to CIO if, uh, if you need that. And we looked at that and said, that business is interesting. It's especially interesting because of the foot in the door with 200 uh, hospitals. And every time they sign a million dollar professional services deal, there's probably a $10 million uh, RCM contract sitting there that that the MedSR never had the capabilities to uh, to handle. And so we looked at that not just for the the revenue from the projects, but as the foot in the door to be able to uh, to sell more services and and more capabilities into the uh, into the hospital space. So you know we think uh, we think there's an advantage to uh, to having focus in uh, in both arenas today. Great, thank you. Um, and as far as analyst coverage is, is it in the healthcare sector or the technology sector or both? Uh, the, the, I was going to say the answer is yes. So some, <laughs> some, some of our analysts uh, tend to be, you know, more technology analysts who, uh, you know, who focus on other tech firms. Some of them tend to be more healthcare uh, analysts who, you know, typically it's not, it's not the person who is doing biotechs and the drugs, but rather who's doing, te, you know, healthcare services, healthcare uh, IT. Uh, but we, you know, we've got analysts that that sort of cover us with uh, with both perspectives, and you know, I do know that uh, you know a lot of uh, a lot of smaller companies today, it's been hard to uh, to get analyst coverage. And when I tell people I've got seven analysts, you know, some of whom are are you know have been covering me for a while, so uh, I've got analysts from everywhere, from from Ladenburg and Maxim, uh, H.C. Wainwright. Uh, uh, benchmark, uh, EF Hutton. I mean, uh, Roth Capital. We've got we've got a bunch of different analysts, and uh, and I think that's good. And you know, I encourage uh, people to you know, if you're interested, uh, you know, reach out. I, I think I've sent you the uh, the reports. You know, I'd say to people, look at all seven of them. You decide which one you like better. Uh, you know, I'm not going to editorialize, uh, but I think they you know they they've all been there. Uh, one of the analysts who's covered us the uh, the longest. Uh, before he uh, started to uh, to cover us, he said, "I need to visit your office." And we said, "Well, Kevin, you've been in our office." He said, "No, no, I mean the real office. I need to go to Pakistan." And he actually flew out to uh, to Pakistan. Wow. Uh, you know, he had seen, you know, he'd been in our office and he'd seen the uh, the Pakistan office on a uh, video conference. He's like, "The quality is too good. The you know, the conference room looks uh, that that's got to be like downstairs." And and you know, a <laughs> day and a half later, he's there and he's like, "Wow, this is actually like a real the real thing." So. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, it, it's good having analysts. Uh, another one, uh, I remember around the time of the IPO, he actually went to uh, to our founder's wife's uh, practice a couple of miles from our headquarters, and he saw the stuff working. And he said, "Geez, you guys, this is actually real. This isn't vaporware." He said, "You know, when I when I when I heard you describe it, I, I figured this wasn't real. I actually saw the nurses typing things in. I saw the patients logging into the patient portal. This was in 2013." And that's and he was like, I, 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 I'm blown away that this is actually really working. So, so we've got analysts who've actually kind of looked at the stuff under the covers to uh, to validate it, which is good. Great. Um, and what needs to happen in order for you to leverage your business model for exponential growth? Yeah. 
So, you know, I, I'd say that, uh, that, you know, while we've grown a lot recently, you know, we're still small. And, uh, you know, I thought it was interesting, the, uh, the analyst from, uh, from Hutton, who, who's, I think, the most recent one to have uh, initiated coverage, uh, in his report, he did a, a good job of saying, you know, what was Athena Health like when they were this size? What were all scripts and next gen and other companies like at this size? Because, you know, people, you know, they, they think about Athena Health and it was well over a billion in revenue when it went private a couple of years ago. They kind of think about their profitability when they were a billion dollar company. Yeah, you know, they forget about where were they when they were a hundred million dollars. And yeah, you know, and it's actually hard at this scale to generate significant profits, especially when you're reinvesting in technology and reinvesting in the uh, in, in the sales and marketing effort. And uh, you know, I think that uh, when I, when I think about our our guidance for 2023 of 142 to 146 million. And I, you know, and I think about growth. Okay, we're going to have nice revenue growth organically. And again, the uh, this year's numbers sort of have twelve percent organic baked in when you take out these uh, these big hospitals. But candidly, if all we do over the next five years is twelve percent a year growth, which, which would be phenomenal, probably make us the fastest growing in our uh, in our space. I don't think we'll be excited. I think we'll be more excited if we find one or two of these uh, game changer opportunities as we did in twenty twenty. And we think about, okay, I'm growing 12% a year. Oh, and by the way, every once in a while, I'm finding something to ratchet up 50%, you know, 25%. So, uh, so to us, you know, as we continue to, uh, to scale, you know, we think that will allow us to bring more to the, uh, to the bottom line. You know, we're, we are, but we're not going to, we're not going to focus on, you know, okay, I want to earn an extra one or 2% this year. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be a little stingy on the R and D I'm going to, I'm going to not invest in the sales and marketing. You know, we, we want to do that because we think that, that, that our investors are really thinking about this from the, uh, from the long-term perspective and, and making those investments is the right thing to do. Um, well, that concludes the questions before we sign off. I just want to, um, let everyone in the audience know that, um, you can reach out to me. Everyone has my email. I'm happy to connect you uh, to CareCloud. And Bill, I'm going to turn it back over to you for any final words uh, for everyone before we say goodbye. I appreciate people taking time out of, uh, of their busy day uh, to uh, to learn more about us. And and again, uh, yeah, the, if, if you're interested, feel free to reach out. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to uh, to chat with uh, with folks. Uh, uh, yeah, I love the idea of people signing up on the website, seeing uh, seeing some of these videos. Even you don't need to see me; you've already seen me. Yeah, you know, see see the offshore office, see see the customers. You know, see a couple members, uh, other members of the management team, even for a couple minutes, and that'll really help you to uh, to get a, a better flavor of, uh, of who we are. So, I hope everybody has a, a great afternoon today. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone, and and have a great day. <laughs>